We are in the middle of the second part of a series going through Ephesians. We started out last fall going through Ephesians 1 through 3. We called that loved because in him we are loved. And we wanted to look at and wanted to explore the scriptures, examine them, and see what God has to say about us. So we took some time last fall and walked through that. And if, if you missed that or you want to catch up, those sermons are all available online on the website. You can also watch them on the app. Um, and now we are in the second part, so we're looking at Ephesians 4 through 6, and it's much more application. This is how do we live, how faith is lived out. And it's really important because what we do with the faith that we have really matters. How we live, act, behave, and speak, it makes an impact on the people around us. As we jump into this, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 today, but as we jump into this, I have a confession to make. I'm an absolute sucker for before and after videos on YouTube. I love them because I love to see the transformation that takes place, whether it's the floor of a forest being turned into this incredible dwelling or a car or whatever. It doesn't really matter to me when somebody posts a video and it's before and you see it's all broken down and then when they're done, it's awesome. I just love them. Anybody else with me? You like them? Okay, way too much time on there, but that's okay because it's, it's redemptive and it's cool. I found this one and we cut it down. This is like an hour and 45 minutes long. I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I couldn't do that. I scrubbed through it, but we cut it down into a very, very short. Check out what this guy does with this car. Yeah, that's a difference, isn't it? This is a master at his craft because at some point that car was brand new. Something happened to it. It broke down. It got abandoned. It rusted out. He found it. He saw something in that car that I never would have dreamt of. And he had the skill to repair it and to put it back to the way that it was intended to be. I could never do that. I popped the hood on a car and I'm like, ha. Ah, Hoses, wires, I can do some basic stuff. I can't even dream of doing that. Was anybody else impressed with that? I think it's, it's just awesome. That demonstrates and illustrates the work of a master, and it really shines. And I need us to keep this in mind as we go through Ephesians 5 today. But as we're going to see, there is no before and after video that you can find on YouTube that's nearly as cool as a before and after in the life of a believer. So with that, turn with me to Ephesians 5. We're going to start in verses 1 and 2. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So Paul's just finished in chapter four. He's just finished telling the church that they are to be kind and compassionate, forgiving, just as they had been forgiven in Christ. And this is a continuation of Paul's thought. And the first thing I want to point out is that imitation is inevitable. We can't help but imitate the people that we spend time around. And while we intentionally imitate the people that we desire, we also end up imitating the people that, that we may not like look up to just because we're around them so much. Years ago, I was a pastor on staff at a church in Colorado, and one of our other pastors had this, he had a phrase. Anybody that you have, we all have our phrase. 
his phrase, anytime he saw something cool, was very clear, very bold, and very obvious. He would see something and go, yeah, baby. <laughs> Never in my life had I been around somebody who said those two words together so much. And one day I was in the office and standing there, I don't remember exactly what happened, but it was cool, I can tell you that. And out of my mouth came two words, yeah, baby. Where did that come from? I had no idea. Like, that just rubbed off on me. And you know it's true. This happens to you too. You find yourself saying things that you never would have said if you weren't hanging around that other person. We do this. Because as my mom likes to say, more is caught than taught. Now, I got another question for you. How many of you are not native to Texas? You, along with me, you would raise... It's okay, you can raise them high. Nobody's going to get shunned here, I promise. Okay. A fair number of us. Now, depending on where you came from, you may or may not have had certain words in your vernacular. If you are from outside Texas, you may never in your life have thought about combining two plural words into a single singular word until you moved here and you found yourself surrounded by people who do. And in Texas, we have a special plural version to make the singular form of a plural word into a super plural. <laughs> All y'all know what I mean. <laughs> this hasn't really rubbed off on me yet. I know some of you are trying. You can keep trying. That's okay. It's rubbed off on my kids. My kids say y'all. I never grew up saying y'all. And I think it's y'all's fault. Actually, it's all y'all's fault <laughs> for getting my kids to say y'all. And it's okay. It's just something that happens because we imitate the people that we are around all the time. The point is we pick up on these mannerisms and characteristics of the people that we're surrounded by. So let us Imitate the best. And let us imitate the ones that we know love us. This is what Paul says. He says, walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. He was a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. We should imitate Jesus because he is the best. He is the supreme example when I was in high school, I transferred from a public school to a private school, and we couldn't do, like, retreats as a public school because it was too big. But this private, Seattle Christian, we did school retreats. Like, you take all the high schoolers to a camp for a couple of days. You do group building activities and competitions. People paint your faces. You get points and candy, whatever, all that. And while we were on this retreat, um, Mr. Whitehead was our Bible teacher, we had two Bible teachers. He was one of them, and, and he was the first Bible teacher at the school that I had the pleasure of being in his class. I remember the first class I had with Mr. Whitehead. It was, I remember the topic of that class. I remember how he talked about He, he talked about God not being your buddy. It was, it was fantastic, really good, really impactful. I had to go into the cabin for something. So I go in the cabin and walk in there, and Mr. Whitehead had taken a few minutes out of all the activities. He was sitting on his bunk, and he had these note cards in his hand. He was just flipping through the note cards. I was like, what are you doing? He, said, he looked up and just said, I'm, I'm working on these verses. I'm trying to memorize them. He's a Bible teacher at a high school. He was a Baptist preacher for years. He's read the Bible most of his life and he was diligently working on memorizing the scriptures, not, not for kudos, not to be used as a sermon illustration one day, but because he loves Jesus and loves the scriptures. And that caught me off guard. It was like, whoa, this guy really loves this. His love for the scriptures propelled an interest and a love in me. And I started memorizing. And then one day later, uh, in class, I was asked to read a passage, and so I went to the front of the class, to the podium, and I opened his Bible to the passage, and I started reading it, and I noticed his Bible is all marked up. He's got highlights and, and notes and cross-references and all kinds of stuff in his Bible that he had learned as he read through this Bible. I'm like, my goodness, this thing's an heirloom. How cool is this? 
And, and that stuck out to me. And so years later, when we had kids, I wanted to have something that I could pass down to them. So we bought journaling Bibles. And we took these journaling Bibles and we, we write notes in them and highlight them with our kids in mind so that when they graduate, we give this to them. And now they have a Bible with notes and highlights and stuff all over it on almost every page where Andrea and I have thought and prayed for our kids as we have read their Bible. You see, I was inspired and I was motivated by what I saw in Mr. Whitehead, and my hope, my desire is to pass that on to my kids. I hope that I'm the kind of guy that they can imitate. But I, I fail, I fumble, I stumble, I fall. But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't, and he is the best example we are ever going to have. He is the supreme example. And it's not a new idea. God has always called his people to imitate him. In Leviticus 19, God gives Moses these commands to give to the people. And this is what he says at the very beginning. He says, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And there's 15, about 15 commands in Leviticus 19, and every one of them ends with some form of God identifying himself as holy. He's saying, this is what I want you to do because this is what I do. These are my characteristics. I want you to imitate them, to model them. We've always been called to imitate God. We we're told to imitate him, to live as he did. We actually have an example to follow. It's not just this ideas that are out in the air. These are real concrete things. And in imitating Jesus, there are certain things that we need to actively do and other things that we must avoid. Some things, there cannot even be a hint. Ephesians 5, 3 through 5, we need to avoid impurity. Paul says this, among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Here's what we should do instead of all of this. Let's give thanks. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Among God's people, there should be not even a hint. Like other lists that we find in Paul's epistles, this isn't comprehensive. This doesn't cover everything, but it does cover the ones that are important to Paul's audience in Ephesus. And in this case, all three of these, the three big ones that he points out, that he repeats, they all can be applied in our day and age. And as we look at this, I want you to think about that. Where do we see these things in our culture as well? And this is important because these things, these behaviors, these habits, characteristics, they cling to us like dirt and grime on the car that has to be scrubbed away so that we can be made new. They have to be removed because they are contrary to God's will for all people. You see, these things, when we act on them, they might be temporarily satisfying, but they lack any kind of eternal satisfaction. So the first one that Paul mentions specifically is sexual sin, sexual immorality. He mentions it twice. And the word here that he uses is porneia. This is fornication, adultery, incest, sodomy. It's unlawful marriage, sexual intercourse in general. It really is anything outside of covenantal marriage between a man and a woman. And it's deadly and it's dangerous. And we have seen this in the lives of people that we love, whether it's watching pornography or following ourselves trapped in a relationship that, that we should not have been in. And we knew it. And please don't hear from me right now condemnation. We all stumble in many ways, but God wants to shine a light on things so that he can bring healing and wholeness and newness. He wants to restore us to his intention for us. 
The truth is, though, that sin, sexual sin, is particularly destructive. It will ruin the person, their work, the family, and their relationships. God put boundaries on our sexuality and sexual expression with our best in mind. He wants to protect us from destructive patterns of behavior. And especially in this area, short-term satisfaction isn't worth long-term consequences. So I want to encourage you, if, if this is something that you struggle with, talk to someone. Talk to one of the pastors here at church. We love you dearly and we want to help. You don't have to fight it alone. It's so serious. It's, it's talked about repeatedly throughout Scripture. And this is what Paul says to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 6, he says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who's, who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. We are told to run from this. It's not something to just be ho-hum about or to, to just slough off. It's something to be taken seriously. Next, he also mentions specifically impurity. And the word that he uses for impurity is akatharsia. It's so hard to say sometimes. Akatharsia. This is a work of the flesh. It's a natural desire of an unrepentant person. And these are things that, that we just do naturally, that when we come to faith in Christ, God takes them from us. And I don't know everybody's story, but as we just saw up here in the waters of baptism, when we trust Christ, there's things that he does to renew us by his spirit, and he'll take away certain things that we struggle with. And that doesn't mean that we don't still stumble. We still mess up. But by the grace of God, it's not held against us, and he will help us. He will help to sanctify us. Uh, thinking back to that car, it wasn't like, hey, here's a car, boom, it's all new. There's no genie. It doesn't happen by magic. It took hard work and hours and probably months to put that thing to how it was supposed to be. And in our lives, true, that, that is also true, that God is working the impurities out of us and restoring us to what he called us to be. And he calls us to impurity, but not to impurity. He calls us to purity. God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness that he has set us apart for. And the third one that he specifically mentions in this passage is greed. And this one, man, it hits home for a lot of us. We live in a very affluent area in a very powerful country, and it's just easy to be greedy. But what does Paul mean by greed? He means this, having more, receiving more, wanting more, outdoing others, being superior, excelling, forging ahead at the cost of others. Or asserting oneself. This includes taking advantage of other people to get ahead. And we're encouraged to do this by our culture. Drive down the tollway and look at the advertisements. Shoot, load a browser. You'll get advertisements popping up. What is it? The job of an advertisement is to convince you that what you have is not enough and you need this newer, shinier, faster, you need this new thing because until you have it, you should not be satisfied. The things that we see, they cause this greed within us. And, and the scriptures specifically tell us not to be greedy, to be content with what we have been given. That doesn't mean you never get a new car. Sometimes cars break down. Sometimes you need something. Sometimes it, it's fine. But to go out and get a new car every month, well, that's greedy. And, and there's all kinds of examples. But we're told not to be greedy. How that works out in your life and in mine is probably different. I've got this, I don't know. I used to go to Fry's Electronics a lot and just walk the aisles because you could like feel the power pulsating from the walls. I, my dad worked in an area near a Fry's, and we would, like, meet there for lunch. It's the worst idea in the world. And then I see these things. like, oh, I want that. That's faster. I want that. That's got better graphics. Uh, that, that's how it is for me. Faster, better, shinier, brighter. 
And what it is for you is probably different. I hope it is. But the key is that we are not greedy, that we are content with what God has given us. And look, Jesus pointed this out too. In Luke 12 and 15, he told them, watch out, be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Someday it's all going to burn. You get the new phone, and a month later they release a newer one. That's how it happens. Our life is not based on our possessions. Your identity should not be wrapped up in possessions. That just makes us greedy. Paul mentions this as well to the church in Corinth. He says, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Let us not be greedy. Paul also, in there, he specifically mentions the way that believers talk. We must avoid the impurity of obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse jesting, of course, joking. That's what everybody else does. But believers in Christ are called to be different. So what's the point of all this? It's we're, we're not supposed to be like everybody else because we are not like everybody else. As we learned earlier in this series, earlier on, we've been saved by grace through faith. It is a gift from God, and we are called to be different. It's hard, though. David Wade of the Pulpit Team sent an email, and he asked a fantastic question. I thought it was really insightful. He said, verse 5, what we just touched on, pretty much catches all of us who have not been made perfect. Anybody in here not perfect yet? If your hand is still down, you're still not perfect. It's a, like, that's all of us. We're not perfect. What does this mean? Does this mean verse 6? Is this coming to all of us? Well, what does verse 6 say? So verse 5, we know and recognize this. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. If you're not perfect yet, do you fear God's wrath? Well, if you've trusted in Christ then you are part of God's kingdom. You are a son or a daughter of God. And when he sees you, he sees his son. If you trust in Christ, you do not have to fear the wrath of God because that's already been satisfied on the cross. You're taken care of. And because of that, you can live in freedom. But just because we have this promised inheritance, it doesn't mean we get to live however we want these characteristics and behaviors, they have no place in the life of a follower of Jesus. Paul points this out to the church in Rome. So the Romans had this idea. They, they ran an equation, and the math goes like this. If God gives grace every time I sin, and I want more grace, then I should sin more to get more grace. That was the math they did. And it was really bad math. So Paul writes them the letter to the Romans. And in chapter 6, he says this. What should we say? Should we continue sinning so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We've died. We don't belong in this world anymore. In fact, we are ambassadors of a different kingdom. We have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. When we trust Christ, we are grafted into the family tree of God, and we become citizens of his kingdom and his ambassadors in this world. We don't belong here. I think this was captured beautifully in the 2003 song by Switchfoot, A Beautiful Letdown. This is what they said. It was a beautiful letdown when I crashed and burned, when I found myself alone, unknown, and hurt. If you think of, of those four things, being crashing and burning, being alone, unknown, and, un, and hurt, how many of you would say, yeah, that's beautiful? I, I, it's just juxtaposed wonderfully. It was a beautiful letdown the day I knew that all the riches this world had to offer me would never do. In a world full of bitter pain and bitter doubts, I was trying so hard to fit in until I found out that I don't belong here. I don't belong here. I will carry a cross in a song where I don't belong. Not only do we not belong here, 
but we have the honor of representing the living God as his ambassadors. As Paul said to the church in Corinth in his follow-up letter in 2 Corinthians, he said, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That, that is what we were made for. And God gives us the opportunity to partner with him in his mission of redemption in the world. When you become a believer in Jesus, you don't sit on the sidelines and just watch and twiddle your thumbs as God does all the amazing stuff. No, he gets you off the bench and onto the field because you're part of his team. You're an ambassador for Christ. And as his representatives, we are called not to dwell in the darkness, but to live in the light. And we find this in verses 6 through 14. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments. For God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible, for what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You see, Jesus brings transformation, and the ultimate transformation is from dark to light. He promised his followers that he came as light into the world. Look what Jesus says in John 12, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. We're blessed to be able to walk in the light and not fumble around in the darkness. Jesus lights the way, and we're called to be reflective. Now, one of the commentaries that I looked at in preparing for this message, the NIV application commentary, the, the author put it this way, and I thought it was so good. It's such a great picture to be reflective. I put it in your notes, and I want to show it to you because he says ours is also a reflective ethic, we're to reflect God's attitude and acts toward us to other people. God is known in the cross and the resurrection. He's not out there to dream about, but present to change lives. He's the standard for our actions, and that we are his children means that we are to copy his acts. We've received grace and forgiveness from him, and we are to show these qualities to others. He loves, and we are to love. I love how this is written. I love the, the point that he makes because the truth is that our job is our role, our calling, and our blessing is that we get to reflect who God is to the world. It's kind of like this mirror. Right? This mirror is not the source of light, but it reflects the light. And, and as something shines on it. I'll try not to blind you, I promise. I'm going to aim it up toward the ceiling. But the source of light is reflected here and then shines and illuminates something else. Mirrors are powerful. And see, you and I, we were made to be mirrors, to reflect God and who he is. But then sin entered the world and destroyed it. And that would be so much cooler if I could shatter that on the stage but I can't, so you have to imagine it. If you drop a mirror, a glass mirror from, from 100 feet up, it's going to just explode, and you're never going to be able to put it back together. That's what happened when sin entered the world. Everything shattered to a degree that we are unable to put it back together. But then Jesus came, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a death we cannot die. He paid the price for our sins. He rose again three days later, and he invites us into his family. So when we trust Jesus, he puts us back together in a way that we can't do ourselves. You see, we were made to reflect God. Uh, 
And even if we're full of cracks and smudges, we still do what God has called us to do. You and I are like this mirror. If you've trusted Jesus, you're put back together. You can do what he has intended for you. It's not perfect. There's still cracks. There's still flaws. But this mirror hangs in my office. I used it years ago as an illustration, and it hangs there. And it can still do what it was supposed to. I can look, I, on the rare occasion that I've had to wear a tie, I've actually used this to help make sure that my tie was where it should be. Because the mirror does its job, even though it's not perfect. That's what Jesus does back to, he does to us. He puts us back together. And we still need to be sanctified. There's still stuff to work on. We still have problems. But God in his grace and his mercy puts us back. Someday, someday we'll be perfect. And we'll be back to this. There will be no cracks, no blemishes, no errors. In God's kingdom. That's what we have to look forward to. That's our inheritance. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're still a mirror in a million little pieces. But as soon as you trust him, he will put you back together. He'll take away your sin. If you've never done that, I want to encourage you, step out of the darkness and into the light and trust Jesus to take away your sins. He's the only one who can. Another thing that light does is expose evil. And this is really important because we all have evil in our lives, but it exposes evil. Years ago, when Andrea and I were first married, her brother, who was super, super generous, he gave us a car. They got something else, and, and this had been given to them, and they gave us this amazing geo tracker. So we have SUVs. We've got like our supersized SUVs, and then we've got regular SUVs, and then you have your mini SUVs, and then you have the tracker. It's a micro SUV. Little tiny thing, but it was so much fun. It was convertible. We drove that thing everywhere. It had all kinds of goofy things wrong with it, but it worked and it was fun to drive, especially on a sunny day. But at this time, we lived in Seattle and it was the winter. And I went out to the car one day and I looked and, and I noticed that the back flap on the back was not quite covering the back door, it was actually tucked inside. And if you're in Washington in the winter, that's a really, really bad combination because then the water won't go outside the car, it goes on the inside. I'm like, oh, no, this is terrible. Um, I got to get this thing dried out. So I had a little detached garage, so I got in it, and I took it into this little detached garage and parked it so that it wouldn't continue to get wet. So the next day I go out and open the garage door. I'm like, ah, that smells kind of funny. Oh, no, that's not funny. That's smelling mildewy. That's the opposite of funny. That's not good. I've got a problem. This is not like the highlight of my life story, I promise you. This is don't do this. It was dumb story. So just caveat. I'm like, I got to kill this. This is a problem. It could get worse. So I went across the street to Fred Meyer and I got a little shop light because light kills mold. At least in my head, that would work. It was the best thing I could do. So I got a light. I put it in there, turned it on, plugged it in, and closed the garage door. Didn't need the car for a couple of days. We could share, make it work. A couple of days later, I go out, I open the garage door, and I'm hit with a wave of something unpleasant. And I open the back of the car to look inside, and now it's not wet. Nope, nope, it's just green. The trunk is covered with mold and mildew all over the fabric, up the walls. I'm like, that's interesting. So I go to the door, and I open the driver's side door, and I look in the back seat, and I'm like, that's less than interesting. The mold had molded around the seats, and the, now it was in the back seat, and it was on the floor. I'm like, oh, that's worse. And I look at the front of the car. The driver's seat is covered in green mold. The gear shifter Hard plastic stuff covered in mold. The steering wheel had mold on it. There's mold on the molding around the doors and windows. There was mold everywhere. I was the proud owner of the mold mobile. <laughs> My little light didn't work. 
So I went inside and I looked at the forecast. Miraculously, for this time of year in Seattle, we had, they were predicting a week of sunshine. I was like, oh, thank God. Literally, that was my prayer. I put on my hazmat suit, went out to the garage, took the car, put it on the street, took the topper off of it. My mold mobile was there for everybody in the neighborhood to see. Everybody got to see my stupidity. And this car was covered for a week. I let the sun come up and go down and come up and just bake this thing. And after a week, I went out with a a whole tub of Lysol wipes, and I wiped it down. And I got it to the point that even my wife could ride in it again. It was really bad. It took a ton of work. But that mold mobile was restored to the point that it was functional. And I tell you this story because when we hide our sin... And we, we, we keep it secret, even maybe just a little bit of light. It just gets worse and worse. And just like with the geotracker, it needed the light of the sun to be restored. So do we. Our sin cannot be hidden. Only the sun could have killed that mold, and only God's son can expose and kill the sin in our lives. And practically how this works out, um, I think it's best to learn from Jesus. It's best to follow his example. So on the surface, this is, this is a really complex. This was difficult to work through because of, of different opinions and, and just how it reads. Look, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what, mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible for what makes everything visible is light. So are we supposed to expose things or are we supposed to not mention them because it's shameful? Which is it? And I read a number of commentators. uh, Some of them say that this applies just to Christians, that when we see sin in Christians' lives, we should expose it. Others say this applies to everybody. When we see sin in anybody's life, we should expose it. So which is it? I think the answer is Yes, I wrestled with this a lot. I even asked the director of a Greek Bible college where my son is in school. I asked him, what do you think? And he was like, yep. All evil, regardless of the perpetrator, should be exposed or it's just going to grow. But we must be careful not to gossip about what people are doing or to talk behind their backs. We have to be bold enough to speak the truth in love. And I want you to consider this one example because it's an interaction that Jesus had with the woman at the well. We don't have time to read it, so I'm just going to summarize. But Jesus leaves Judea, and he's on his way up to Galilee, and he stops in Samaria. And if you're on that road, a real religious, awesome Jewish person, they would go 20 miles around Samaria to avoid the Samaritans. That's how much they didn't like them. Jesus just goes, forget that, and goes straight on through. And he sits down at a well at noon because he's hot and he's exhausted. It's the heat of the day. Well, a woman comes out to draw water, and Jesus Jesus asks her for a drink, and and she's really, she's taken aback. She's like, you're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. This doesn't happen. We can't be doing this. But she's like, "Uh, why are you asking me for a drink? Because she's so used to being shunned and ignored, and it's the middle of the day. Why is she out there in the middle of the day? Everybody else in her town goes out at the first thing in the morning because it's hot in the Judean desert. And so she goes out in the middle of the day because she is avoiding everyone else. She's ashamed. She's the pariah of her community. And so she asks him, uh, why are you asking me for water? I don't understand. And Jesus' response takes her back. He says, if you knew the gift of God, who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. What? Well, she's very curious about this, so she bites, and she asks Jesus, do you really think you're greater than Jacob, the great patriarch who dug this well that we drink out of? And Jesus responds. He tells her that only he, Jesus, can provide living water. And she's like, that sounds like a great idea. I would love to never be thirsty again and to be able not to have to come out here and get water. Where do I get it? Please, can I have some? And Jesus says, go and uh, get your husband. And she says, I don't have one. And at this point, Jesus throws off his metaphorical cloak. He reveals himself and tells her she has spoken the truth. He says this, the truth is you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. 
What you said is true. Now, you can read that a couple of ways. One way is a condemning, angry, screaming voice. Well, that's all right. Or I think Jesus is simply stating fact, speaking the truth in love. And he does it in a way that she's able to receive what he's saying. So now she recognizes that Jesus is the prophet, that he is the Messiah. She goes and she tells everybody in town about Jesus. And because of her testimony, many people in the town come to believe in him. You see, her sin was exposed in a way that she was able to be receptive. And I think that is what Ephesians is telling us to do too, to speak the truth in love, not to shy away from it, but to, to speak up in such a way that people are able to see their sin, to expose them. And we talked about this last week. Just last week, Wayne was preaching on the end of Ephesians 4 and talking about speaking the truth in love. If you need a reminder on that, you can go back and watch that sermon. It was fantastic. And Paul concludes this thought with what many scholars think is like a super mashup of Old Testament passages because Jesus' resurrection is the basis for our living light. He says this, Therefore it is said, Get up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's time to take action. It's time to get up. It's time to walk in the light because we've been called to live in the light. So I want to close with a couple of questions. Where are the areas in your life that are hiding in the dark? What needs to be exposed? Will you let Jesus expose that? What mold is growing in your heart or in your life that just needs to be baked by the sun? Let the Son of God bake it all away. May we live in the light and reflect the light that comes from God, and expose evil anywhere it exists, that we might live as true ambassadors for God in a broken world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the way that your word exposes things. And, and God, it, but you don't just expose things. You offer grace, and you offer the way for us to be healed, to be whole, to be healthy, to be made new. And God, I pray for each of us that we would indeed be made new, that we'd be made in your image, that we would imitate you, and that you would, that you would work in us in such a way that the reflection that we show to others is a pure reflection of who you are. If you're with us today and you have never trusted Jesus, you're still a broken, shattered mirror. And today you would say, today's the day of salvation. Today is the day that I trust Jesus to take away my sins. As everybody's praying, nobody's looking around, would you please just raise your hand? I want to celebrate with you. And, and I want to welcome you to the family of God. So if that's you, today God's speaking to your heart and he's calling you. If you're online and watching with us from afar, let your host know so that we can celebrate with you in that as well. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives, and I pray that you would use us greatly. Let us shine brightly for you. In Jesus' name, amen.